Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 965th New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation featuring Pepe Carmel, Emily Braun, Rebecca Schiffman, Marianne Cos, Saul Ostro, Amanda Glubizi, and Phyllis Tuckman. We're also thrilled to welcome poet Ron Horning here to close today's program. And now I will introduce our wonderful guests and host. Pepe Carmel is a professor in the Department of Art History at NYU. He is the author of several books, most recently looking at Picasso. He has written widely on modern and contemporary art for museum catalogs, as well as for the Brooklyn Rail and other publications. Emily Braun is distinguished professor at Hunter College and at the Graduate Center and CUNY curator at the Leonard A. Lauder Collection. A scholar of modern Italian art and of Cubism, Braun has also organized several award-winning exhibitions. Rebecca Schiffman is a Brooklyn-based writer, editor, and art historian. She's currently working towards her master's in art history at Hunter College and is the assistant editor at Art and Object. Distinguished Professor Emerita of several PhD literature programs at CUNY, Mary Ann Cause holds a Doctor of Humane Letters, is an officer in the Palme de Académiques, and a Chevalier in the Order of Arts and Letters, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Independent curator and cure and critic and co-founder of Critical uh, Practices Inc., Saul Ostro has organized over 80 exhibitions and his writings have appeared in art magazines, journals, and catalogs in the USA and Europe. Amanda Gluibizi is the founding co-director of New Foundations for Art History and art scene editor for the Brooklyn Rail. Amanda is the author of Art in Design in 1960s New York from Anthem Press. And our host today, Phyllis Tuckman, is a critic and art historian. Phyllis teaches and writes about art, particularly sculpture. She's taught at Williams College, Hunter College, and the School of Visual Arts, and she is an editor-at-large here at the Brooklyn Rail. Thank you all so much for being here today to discuss CASO together, and I'm so excited to hear from you all. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Phyllis. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, today, we're commemorating the death of Pablo Picasso 50 years ago. As it is for several months, there have been countless shows organized in museums and art galleries, as well as articles in newspapers and magazines. William S. Rubin, former head of the painting and sculpture department at the Museum of Modern Art, put it best decades ago when he wrote that people eventually won't remember Richard Nixon and his transgressions, but they won't forget Picasso. The weekend Picasso died in April 1973 was memorable for me. On the Friday, I handed in my master's thesis on Guernica. Robert Goldwater, my advisor at the IFA, passed away. That Sunday, we lost Picasso. I learned a lot writing about Guernica. I discovered that in terms of Picasso scholarship, explanations, insights, and revelations should make sense. When delivering a seminar report on Guernica, I didn't understand why everyone was quoting the London Times. It seemed to me Picasso would have been reading a French newspaper. So there I was in my early 20s. I phoned architect Jose Luis Sert in Cambridge, Mass, and asked which journal he and his colleagues were reading during the Spanish Civil War. Humanité, he told me. <laughs> and in Humanité's coverage of the bombing of Guernica, and its aftermath, I was able to trace the record of the drawings and progress of Picasso on the mural. Right now, I'll just mention that a soldier 
had always been present on the large canvas. But after the airplane blew up in which General Mola was flying, he oversaw the bombing of the Spanish town. They only found his head and arm. Ergo, that's why Picasso has that head and those two arms. Can we have the next slide? Most recently, I wrote about Picasso's variations on the women of Algiers, which was painted after the death of Matisse. Everyone has connected Matisse's painting of a blue nude here introduced in um, variation E. Everyone has connected that to a nude that's in the Baltimore Museum of Art. Now, go back, go back. Everyone has connected this blue nude, which then was in the final version O of the painting. But after that incredible cutout show at the Museum of Modern Art, it was obvious that this blue nude connects to Matisse's cutouts. Can we have the next slide? Thank you. Um, there are so many variations on the blue nudes. It's astonishing. It's astonishing that no one had ever connected these cutouts to Picasso's painting. And um, well, we'll leave it at that. Anyway. Um, I'm a firm believer in what we say about Picasso has to make sense. And we're very lucky that the next two speakers, Pepe Carmel and Emily Braun, have uh, written catalogs and curated shows that make so much sense of Cubism. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, this, we're, we're off to a great start with those images and, and with your recollections. So um, it's really an honor to be here today with this you know, wonderful group of speakers. And Mimi, it, you and I have talked so much about Cubism over the years. It's great to be able to continue the conversation um, on this occasion. So I thought I'd kick off with just a kind of you know, Cubism 101. Um, things that probably everyone who's listening today already knows, so I hope it's not redundant, but just to go back over some basics as to why this is so revolutionary and, and so important for the 20th century, uh, it's it's useful to remember that Cubism has a, a series of different phases, and one of the early phases is what you see on the right, that faceted style of summer 1909, where Picasso takes what's still a, a solid three-dimensional form and breaks it into triangular, quadrilateral, rhomboidal forms, but they all cover the surface. And, and his goal here was to define form more precisely. He said to Leo Stein, when you look at a woman in a Raphael, you can't tell where her nose is in relation to the rest of her face, but when you look at one of my figures, you can. Leo Stein was not impressed by this remark, but in any case, this gives us some sense of, of Picasso's motivation. And thinking about this in recent years, it's occurred to me that this kind of faceting weirdly anticipates uh, contemporary technology for animation, like the kind of wireframe head you see on the left, where by taking figures and dividing them into hundreds or thousands of little geometric units, you can push and pull to create a, a 3D figure and actually bring it to a kind of life in animation. Uh, Eleanor, if we could go forward, please. Then the, the next big turning point comes in uh, the summer of 1910, uh, when Picasso uh, goes off to the, the beach town of Caracas in, in Spain near the border with France, 
and starts drawing these figures and then ultimately painting figures where the facets, which previously covered the surface of a coherent three-dimensional form, now unfold and start spreading out into space. And you can see this in the, the drawing on the left, which is in the uh, show at the uh, Metropolitan right now that I'll come back to later, so that there are um, you know those two triangles just above center, which are actually the insides, the, the contours of the insides of the figure's arms, there are horizontal lines that indicate the shoulders, curves that indicate breasts, other things, uh, and, and so forth. But they're all kind of spreading out in space, and you feel like the 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 breeze on the beach is is actually kind of blowing through the figure. So um, Picasso's dealer Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, who was also the first great Cubist critic, uh, referred to this as the breaking open of the closed form, and and pinpointed this as an absolutely essential revolution in the development of Cubism. Uh, let's see, Eleanor, if we could go to the next, please. So this, Picasso keeps going with this idea, and by 1911, a year later, is has taken this structure of tilted, overlapping planes that are no longer describing a single closed form and extended it to the picture as a whole. So here on the right, in Still Life with Fan, L'Homme des Pendant, in theory, we're looking at something, maybe a cafe table with uh, a wine glass, a glass with straws, maybe a glass of lemonade. There's a woman's fan hinged at the bottom in the center. And there's a newspaper lying on the table, uh, which is depicted in an angle. And then Picasso has added the lettering of the title of the newspaper, L'Homme des Pendant, which is an idea he got from Brock to reproduce printed lettering. And all these things overlap. You can't really tell where they are in, in space anymore. It's like a collection of moments of perception that are brought together within the structure of the picture. The structure of the picture now has its own independent logic, which does not depend on knowing where things actually were or things actually are in space. So this creates, you know, an absolute breakthrough into a painting that's independent of reproduction of what we see, while at the same time depicting the recognizable world. Then in um, the following year, I don't know if we could go forward yet again, there's this sudden stripping down of cubism. In fact, many of the overlying structures remain the same, but they suddenly become visible. They're fewer lines, fewer colors, often less paint. I mean, here I'm showing you a papier collé on the left, which is a drawing with pasted papers, but even the paintings, things get simpler. And now we see the vertical and horizontal lines that form a kind of lattice holding everything together and the tilted planes and the curves are as it were stuck onto this lattice. If you imagine you know, a jungle gym and a playground, or for that matter, those, you know, fantastic recent sculptures by Sarah Z with the kind of 3D lattice making a globe and then screens with images scattered around them. I mean, that is in fact a descendant of this kind of cubism. Uh, but also Picasso at this moment, responding once again to Brock starts introducing strips of newsprint. So the real world gets back into the picture not by reproducing what things look like, but by bringing chunks of reality in. Obviously, it's just a short step from this to Duchamp and the idea of the ready-made. You know, you start putting real things in the picture, and after a while, you ask, well, what do you need the picture for? Why not just have the real thing? Also, of course, uh, you know, again, I'm not saying anything everyone here doesn't already know this structure of verticals and horizontals is tremendously influential on, you know, other artists you've heard of, like Pete Mondrian and Kazimir Malevich. So the whole story of geometric abstraction really takes this kind of picture as its point of departure. And uh, I'm trying to remember the last one, if we go forward once again, Eleanor. Okay, let me hand this off to Mimi, who I think is going to bring in some other very important issues. And all over to you. Thank you, Pepe. Actually, Eleanor, do you mind just going back one, back to Pepe's last comparison? Thank you. So Pepe's just given us the overview, the stylistic uh, evolution of uh, cubism. 
uh, cubism as it came to be known, unfortunately, a pejorative term that was given in the fall of uh, 1908, because the painting of little cubes has very little to do with what is going on uh, in the cubist revolution. Another productive, generative, and perhaps even postmodern way of looking at cubism and Picasso's singular contribution to it is as follows. Uh, to see it as a concerted interrogation of the Western pictorial tradition, and by that I mean easel painting. This interrogation writ large, not just on the level of radical formal innovation, which it was, but also an interrogation of its conventions of genres, its convention of representing gender, and its conventions of uh, material using materials and materiality. So first and foremost, as Pepe just articulated, uh, the dismantling of the very means by which three-dimensional illusion is created on a two-dimensional surface. Uh, and that would be uh, atmospheric and linear perspective, and then various techniques of light, dark, or chiaroscuro modeling. All the skills of academic tradition are brought to bear and then taken apart uh, so that the tricks of the trade are exposed, be they fine art traditional training as in Picasso or that of commercial uh, illusionism as in the case of Brock. The upshot of all of this is uh, a new way of looking at pictures, which is no longer the emphasis on what is being represented, but how it is represented. The viewer is suddenly asked to understand the how and not just the what. And by 1910, we have, as on uh, the work on the right in, in 11, we, we arrive at a space so insubstantial that clues, symbols such as treble clefs or letters have to be introduced to allow the, the viewer to figure out what this might be representing, a newspaper on a tabletop that is a still life. Okay, now we can move forward, Eleanor, thank you. So here's the, the great cubist shift, not the what, but the how, and all the conventions that were used in traditional uh, representation. To begin with, it's decorum or propriety. As Leo Steinberg said years ago, uh, the Demoiselle d'Avignon may or may not be the first cubist picture but it does mark a radical break with the decorum and propriety of uh, Western painting. Uh, through its grafting of African tribal sculpture onto the now modern tradition of the nude, that is the nude made modern with a Manet's realist depiction of the nude as the courtesan. But here an unprecedented radical violent treatment of the female nude. And Picasso's cubism goes further because it begins to play with and confound the genres not just the nude, but still life and landscape and the portrait. And the two nudes on the right, for example, people are often struck by, is it, are often say to themselves, and I've heard this repeatedly, are these two nudes in the studio or are they in the landscape? And it's both. And repeatedly in 1909 in particular, Picasso was putting nudes in armchairs with a landscape background. So he's raising the question of, of what is what genre are we in? And he's also raising the question of gender identification and what in his time, a binary of masculine and feminine or male or female. So if you look at the figure on the left, if you were to remove the semicircles that denote the breasts uh, and perhaps also the canting of the head, which we are conditioned to think of as female, you'd otherwise be hard pressed to decide if it was a female or a male figure. And Picasso does this again and again, particularly in 1909, uh, where he also makes female figures very masculine, uh, but he's also with the hairs, with uh, the way that hair is depicted or not depicted as the case may be, um, asking us to determine, is it a male or female or to what uh, ends it is neither nor. May I have the next, please? And this, oh, actually, if you could just go back a sec, Eleanor, I think this is really critical. Um, uh, uh, Phyllis asked us to speak to what makes Picasso's cubism different than say Brock or Gris. And one essential thing is his focus on the figure. Brock was not a figure painting painter. His cubism, I think, uh, includes one female nude. And, and Gris did a few cubist nudes, but, but Brock, uh, Picasso was really focusing up until about 1912, when he switches to still life, on this Western tradition of figure painting. And uh, may we have the next, please? Okay, let's, very good. And then with Still Life with Chair Caning of 1912, which introduces uh, Lodge uh, into the picture, 
we have been playing also uh, with, with many ideas here, but first and foremost, um, in intervening with real materiality into the traditional fine art easel painting, not just the illusionistically depicted material real chair caning, but also the rope around the edge of the picture, which is an imitation of a real carved wood frame imitating rope. So he's now beginning to play with def definitions of real and fake and truth and falsehood. He goes on uh, with uh, this cubist, so-called cubist sculpture on the right, the absinthe glass, one of six casts, which is then individually hand painted. And right there and then you see that he's playing with the whole issue of what is unique and what is a multiple. It is after all, technically a multiple, but he's made it unique, each one by hand painting. And then he's introduced the real absinthe spoon uh, to confound the viewer again about conventions of sculpture in this case, and also introducing a new art form of assemblage. So this heterogeneity of, of, of cubism with its materials, Picasso's, uh, is, is another way in which he challenges the Western tradition. And lastly, um, and I'm speeding through this because uh, rightly so of our time constraints, uh, the woman in a chemise in an armchair of 1913 on the right, uh, which um, brings us to cubism as Picasso's cubism as pastiche, as a pastiche of historical citations. Uh, here we have uh, Ingres meets African tribal sculpture and soft pornographic postcards and pinup uh, photography, which is all brought together uh, in a picture which has uh, been accused of, of being misogynist, but also by certain feminist art historians as being Picasso's parody of uh, soft pornographic treatment in popular culture of female nudes. So on so many levels, Picasso's cubism challenges uh, the Western tradition and makes us aware of its illusionistic techniques, its conventions of genre, its conventions of, of depicting masculinity and femininity or androgynous figures um, and high and of low. And uh, that's why it's much, much more um, than just the painting of little cubes. Thank you. So, um... Eleanor, do we still have a couple of minutes for this segment? Because Mimi, I, I wanted to go back to something you were just showing us, the, the two nudes uh, seated on the right of, at the beginning of your presentation. Um, Eleanor, if we can bring those back, please. Thank you. I, I, I want to add, you know, I, I, Mimi has just pointed to, you know, all kinds of incredibly important issues and thinking about Picasso that, you know, one of among the reasons that he's still a, fi a figure of vital interest today. And I hope I brought out some other issues in his work, but there's also something just about the sheer power of the paintings. And one of the things I love about these, this two nudes on the right is that it doesn't fit into any neat formal, you know, historical evolution, like the one I was trying to put together, you know, that, I went step by step by, and it all I hope made sense because I left a whole lot out. Pictures like this with the Cezannean shading, the bodies that are flat in some places and then profoundly modeled in others like the, the thigh uh, and the buttock on the left. Uh, and as you were pointing out, you know, are we in an interior? Are we in an exterior? Are we in a landscape? They are so mysterious and so powerful. I mean, me, me, why do you think these, are, why is this so great? Uh, well, I guess because it confounds the categories with which we have been trained or um, ex exposed to and, and asks us to reconsider those categories when we can't find and when the image doesn't fall easily uh, into them. Uh, that's one answer. One answer is simply the, the monumentality and the uh, technical facility, which Picasso is always using and showing off. I mean, to, to plug this back into the real world, you, you've spent you know decades working with Leonard Lauder on assembling this you know utterly amazing collection of pictures, and um, you know I'm I've been impressed over and over by your joint decisions to you know, pick out, to find paintings like this that are incredibly powerful and that don't, don't necessarily fit into a conventional narrative. Do you remember the first time you saw this firsthand? You know, what did it feel like? 
This particular picture was uh, acquired by Mr. Leonard Lauder bef before I started as his curator in 1987. But I do remember looking at this picture and, and being, uh, first of all, noting that it had been lined, <laughs> <laughs> which is a rare, a rare um, a thing in, in the collection, in the pictures that he has acquired. Uh, but also being kind of stupefied by the almost by the unconventional depiction of the heads, the removal of specific facial facial features, the um, uh, the modernity of the abstraction of of the skull and of of the faces, which some might interpret as a kind of profound dehumanization. And here we are in years uh, before the the First World War and, and not after, and this extreme reduction and the treatment of the nude, which is really unprecedented. Yes, yes. Um, Phyllis, should we hand this back to you? Uh, well, my comment about those two nudes is, is partly how physical they are. I was astonished many, a, a very long time ago at the old tape, which is now the tape written. The, the physicality of Picasso's figures is astonishing. He just, you could see the man wanted to make sculpture and he did make sculpture, but he was able to paint that way. So uh, I guess we're we're going to, if, if you want, we can continue now. Um, okay. uh, the Brooklyn Rail has an astonishing number of reviews in the December, January issue of the many Picasso gallery and museum exhibitions around the city. So uh, we have uh, the reviewers speaking about their experience now. Thank you. Okay, should I butt in right now? Please do. Okay. So uh, Picasso said, I represent Spain in exile. And Yo Picasso that you're looking at on the left was never a Frenchman. And he signed himself Picasso Artiste Peintre Espagnol. Max Jacob re reported that Picasso often said, I'm probably a painter without style. I shift about too much. I move too often. You see, you see me here and yet I've already changed. I'm already elsewhere. I never stay in one place. And that's why I have no style. So you on the left seems to be a self-presentation quite like himself, but signaling a kind of marked up armor as if in combat with this person uniformed. At first I focused on the odd white slash on the left middle edge which seemed deliberately marking a kind of attention arousing signal. Then in echo on the right, I looked at another of the same kind of slash, but larger in a traveling gaze, our left to our right, and it was impossible not to see his unequal eyes staring at me. The one on my right, that is his left eye, larger and scarier. I really was scared looking at him. This time his ear seemed to have an extra small white addition, increasing somehow that stare. And echoing that blob, the large upstanding white color as if sporting a priest-like garb. Then I slid my gaze down between the initial left and right whitish slashes to the larger bluish white vertical blob on his black vest or armor. And suddenly this time it seemed in concord with his right eye as if it were directing the downward slide directly to that blob's left side, a smaller slash. Then I was somehow able to travel to the right to that angle downward slash with a bend at its elbow as if a kind of plummeting frame to that staring face. Similarly to the far right, a series of smaller slashes right under the elbow, four of them, two horizontal whitish, and then beneath them, two vertical ones. Now the whole thing made a pattern as if the priestly warrior-like figure with its declaration of its own being, yo, were loudly saying, this is who I am, see me here. And then the title finally came into play for me. An étranger nommé Picasso, a foreigner called Picasso in a serious and self-naming play or drama. I, naming myself, am indeed a Spaniard, entitling myself, yo, no kind of je or moi, no way. Never needed really to pretend to be a Frenchman, although he tried at one point, as we know. I think, and I think strongly of his emphasis on naming, 
sang to his close friend, Mike Jacob, with whom he shared their one hat. I love it. I've always loved it. What you have to do, he's talking to Mike Jacob. What you have to do is name things. You have to call them by their name. I name the eye. I name the foot to name. That's all. That's enough. He declared about his paintings, and that surely includes the self-portrait. I put in my paintings everything I love. A tough luck for the things they just have to get along with each other. Those slashes get along with that black shirt or uniform, and Picasso certainly got along with himself. You, Picasso. And in the new Au Miroir Jaune, this totally amazing, I mean, that one just floors me, totally. Totally amazing, complicated, nude, and the glorious yellow mirror. At first, I couldn't absorb the wealth of detail. Against those white and black stripes, like a Venetian blind, or then a set of piano keys, that astonishing naked figure with its observant eyes and its teeth like a comb for the throat and its hairs dangling or draping behind the protuberant tummy with the navel above and the little feet echoing the eyes, quite adorable. And then my goodness, on the wall on which the mirror hangs, the echo of those stripes with the shadow on the right gazing and speaking at the mirror. So it now became an entire drama of striping and speaking or shouting or just being amazed at the mirrored scene. A word I seldom use, but quite a grand word, the word agape comes suddenly to mind. That naked man, although that tummy reminds me of a pregnancy, is quite like a skeleton gaped at. That head confronting us from the mirror could have inserted those teeth and comb into its mouth agape, given Picasso's genius, yo, Picasso. So then Picasso, l'étranger, the foreigner so much one of us, and in no way the stranger, l'étranger, of course, being both, was in no way either a coward, as the yellow frame of a mirror might have suggested to French people of an epoch when I used to go to France in the beginning, and the term confronting comes to mind as the term agape did just now. I think this is confronting. The loudly declaiming self, you, in which we should read loudly aloud the exclamation point, you, inserts himself in the skeleton shape of a new au miroir jaune and sees his own death with his stare transfixed, indeed mirrored. His armor with its slashes for bravery marks him as no foreigner, no stranger to death. We, many of us, joined to salute his life and his death in Avignon, Sorry. just as we had piled in his honor when Guernica made its farewell to New York. We all stood in line and bade farewell. To confront those two works, these two works you're looking at, is to salute that foreigner as in no way a stranger, except a very momentous one. The strength of the embattled armor imposes its very self upon that mirrored skeleton and we salute them both thank you oh my god thank you Hello. Now, sorry yeah thank you just want to say thank you for including me in this conversation i'm so excited um i worked on a review for the moma show picasso and fontainebleau um, and the show focuses on a summer um, of 1921, where Picasso brought his wife, Olga, and their newborn son, Paul, to, the, to Fontainebleau, a, city small, a small city right outside of Paris. During this time, the, Picasso worked in a small garage studio in their house, and he produced two very large and astonishingly different looking paintings, and he made two versions of each of them. So the first one was Woman at the, Three Women at the Spring, and there are three colossal and sculptural women painted in a neoclassical style. They crowd around a spring, each holding an amphora. Their dress and setting evoke Greco-Roman antiquity. And Picasso produced one major painting of the three women and one, one large-scale red chalk drawing of the group. And he also made many preparatory sketches of the women, many of which are on view in the exhibition. Um, yeah, so you can see those on the left and right side. Um, if you can go back to the other one, I was just going to mention it. So this work, The Spring, shows the trope quite clearly that he emphasizes in Three Women at the Spring. So here we see a woman in a white gauzy tunic who leisurely lies down in a classical landscape. But though it's rendered in a more realistic classical style, Picasso, still a cubist, has those notions in mind. So her body is bulbous. 
She kind of has awkward proportions. She reads is immensely heavy. She doesn't, to me, look very human, but rather a chiseled giant sculpture in relief. Um, and then if you could go to the Three Musicians slide. So this is the other major work, Three Musicians. Um, it's a complete opposite of the Three Women at the Spring, though in letters to Alfred Barr, Picasso retained that he worked on both canvases simultaneously. For Three Musicians, of which there are no preparatory sketches, aside from a small charcoal drawing of a monk that doesn't really resemble the monk here on the right side of the canvas, uh, we see a colorful costume trio of masked performers represented in Picasso's Cubist style. So we see a harlequin, a Pierrot, and a monk all seated behind a table on a box-like stage with flat planes of color functioning as their bodies. And there are two versions of the three musicians as well. So the show overall is a deep dive into Picasso's summer in Fontainebleau, not only reuniting these four major canvases for the first time since they were in the studio, but incorporating photog photographs, letters from friends who visited, maps of the city of Fontainebleau, and how Picasso was inspired by the city. And it also trans um, part of the exhibition which I wrote about was that it transforms a hallway into the exact dimensions of his garage studio, allowing us to see what it was like to work on these giant canvases in such a closed and cramped space. Wow. And I guess I was just thinking what, just to conclude um, question was, what was he thinking to conceive of two artworks in such different styles with such different subjects on such a grand scale? And also why make two of them? Well, the, 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 the painting on the left, the one from the Philadelphia Museum, um, they have investigated it and it's in a catalog with a black cover that the Musée Picasso issued with a photography show. It originally had only two figures and at the last moment he added the monk. Wow. Pepe. Hi there. So uh, <laughs> back to cubism, back more of me talking about cubism. It's getting a little embarrassing. Um, so this is a really wonderful little gem of a show that's at the Metropolitan Museum. It's, it's one in a series of focus shows organized by the Lauder Center. Um, in this case, the starting point is a overlooked historical episode uh, that the uh, curate, the lead curator, Anna Josefaka, went back and investigated. It turns out that there was a guy named Hamilton Easterfield living in Brooklyn. I mean, where else? Of course, you know, le leading cultural center since 1909, um, who had met Picasso during a visit to France uh, in that year and thought, wow, this is great, and wrote him a letter in the spring of 1910 saying, you know, you ought to be making decorations, You're not just easel paintings. Uh, you need to be making decorations. And it so happens I have a library in my brownstone and I'd like you to do a series of panels to decorate the room, completely covering all of the walls. I mean, you know, those of you who remember, you know, Clement Greenberg, has he been canceled? Are we still allowed to talk about Clement Greenberg? But uh, Greenberg, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Jackson Pollock talked about the, the shift from the easel painting to the wall painting 30 years later, but uh, Hamilton Easterfield was already thinking about this in 1909, 1910. So in 1910, he sends Picasso a letter with the exact dimensions of all the spaces in his library he'd like him to fill. And amazingly enough, Picasso says yes, and he starts working on uh, figures and compositions and thinking about what's what's going to go into these spaces. And he keeps coming up in his letters for a number of years. Unfortunately, a lot of the really big paintings that we know we actually worked on, because we can see them in studio photographs, have been lost or were destroyed. They just didn't work out. But what survives is our, our group of canvases that um, Joseph Aka, together with the Met curator Lauren Rosati, have brought together which are a number of vertical paintings intended mostly to go next to doorways. Actually, Eleanor, can we stay with the last slide for just a moment? Thank you. 
Uh, and then a number of long horizontal paintings that were intended to go over the doorways. Those are the ones you see on the far wall together with one of the vertical paintings. On the right wall, there are some drawings, including I think one that I showed earlier. So what I love about this show is it is really a deep dive into a particular moment and a particular set of issues and you know, brings this moment in history uh, back, you know, back alive. The other thing that's a, a little bit disguised by the photograph, which makes the walls look white, they're actually a kind of pale brown, is that it recreates the sense of a domestic interior, of the idea of making, a cubist painting is something that wasn't designed necessarily to go into museums, but was meant to go into houses. And, you know, that would have been even more true in Hamilton Easterfield's library uh, than elsewhere. And the installation, I think, very beautifully gives the sense of being a room. It looks much bigger in this photograph than it is in real life. So there's a kind of intimacy to it that you don't always feel in uh, museum installations, which is something that, uh, as we were just hearing, uh, Anne Umland, the curator of the Fontainebleau show, tried to recreate with that passageway that we just heard about that is literally the size of Picasso's garage that he was working in. So getting back to how small, how intimate things were at the time. So I could go on and on about this show. And of course it's in my, my review for the, the rail, but I want to pick out just one aspect, which is the idea of decoration. Now, Eleanor, if we could go forward. This is something that uh, Field said specifically in his letter to Picasso that you need to make decorations and not just paintings. And of course, you know, what does that mean? How does that fit together with cubism? This is really quite a mystery. Uh, but I think we can begin to get some sense of what it meant by looking at how Picasso's thoughts about this project evolved, because Picasso kept working on it for almost a decade. In the end, it was never finished. The paintings never went to Brooklyn. They all got distributed. But I want to pick out these three pictures, which in effect are three tries, three essays at making uh, a vertical painting that would fit into one of those spaces that Field had defined for Picasso. So on the left is what's probably the, app, the very first painting for this commission, the Nude Woman of Summer 1910, which is extremely geometric. It's the breaking open of the closed form that I was discussing earlier. It's very hard to read, but if you try hard, you can see the figure in there. I'm not going to go into a detailed reading now, but it's still relatively simple. I mean, there's you know, a, a series of geometric forms that are spread out here and there on the canvas and inserted into a kind of lattice or grid of horizontal and vertical bands, light and dark. In 1911, still working on this commission, Picasso paints this picture, Man with Mandolin, and a, a, a pendant to it called Man with Guitar that's also in the picture, in, in, sorry, in the exhibition. And it's very odd because in both cases, he did the upper part of the picture as though he were just doing a conventional um, easel painting. And then he added more canvas down beneath to make it, to get closer to the right dimensions for Fields Library, but he didn't quite finish the bottoms. So one thing that strikes me in this man with mandolin is the clarity of the bottom, which is kind of like the 1910 painting, and then the top part, which has been painted and repainted and repainted from studio photographs and other things. We can see that Picasso did like five, six different versions of the figure, and he just kept adding them. He didn't eliminate what was there before. We're looking... Um, at you know, multiple alternate versions of the figure all crammed together, which is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm quoting the review now, but it's like the multiverse. Uh, somebody just said in the chat, well, Picasso got to the fourth dimension before Einstein. He got to the multiverse a long time before the people who started talking about that a few years ago. But all of this still begs the question, well, what, what does decorative mean? One answer is to be found in the paintings, for instance, that Matisse made for uh, Sergei Shukin, the Russian collector, like The Dance of 1909. There's an alternate version of that painting in the modern, so we could, you know, we all know what it looks like. Big simplified forms, but 
The paintings on the left here in the center are not simplified. They're incredibly dense and complicated, and it's hard to see really how they qualify as decorations. But by 1915, I think Picasso was thinking actively about decoration, and he came back to this theme again, this time a woman with a guitar, and you can see how he simplified his forms. This is still deep cubism, but there's these much bigger planes with black and uh, you know, kind of purple colors and the heavy red background. He's working his way towards a decorative cubism. And, you know, unfortunately for Hamilton Easterfield, and unfortunately for New York, this suite of paintings was never finished. It never came here. But what we have in compensation are exactly the versions of the three women, the Philadelphia version and the New York version that's always at MoMA that we just saw from the Fontainebleau show, which it seems to me are the masterpieces of this decorative style. This is where setting aside the field commission. I mean, it would be great if those two paintings actually would have fit in the field's library, but they don't match the dimensions in the letter. But I think that they are the heirs to this project. These are where Picasso says, okay, now I get it. Now I know what I could have done or should do for field and out come these two astonishing masterpieces of late cubism. So I hope when you see the show or if you go back to see it again, that you'll be thinking about that even longer more complex and incredibly rich history. Thanks, Pepe. And I hope I hope everyone who's listening reads your review, which is sensational. Thank you. So thank you. And uh, I think Saul is next. Yes. Well, I think you're muted. Okay, start all over again. <laughs> I did the face notebook show, uh, which was a small Picasso retrospect. Uh, one of the interesting things about that exhibition for me, uh, not being a Picasso expert or even an art historian, uh, that one realizes that Picasso is not a cubist. It's it's one of Picasso's many, many styles. It, Picasso carries it over as a trope throughout his, his lifetime, but his concerns uh, become, seemingly become significantly different. One looks at them in these notebooks in terms of Picasso's processes. And there's more than one process at work. Uh, some, of the, some of the sketches, some of the drawings in it are seemingly arbitrary notation, so on and so forth. And still others like this, this page, we see Picasso working through certain problems. And over a period of time, in almost a traditional manner, compositional problems, iconographic problems, so on. Besides that, these, these give, so ultimately these notebooks and the exhibition built around them gives us an, an insight into Picasso's stylistic wanderings. The, seemingly what I take away from this is Picasso obviously is never an abstract painter. He's always an abstractionist. He's always concerned with the figure or with modes of representation that he literally gets to the, a certain point where he's, he faces that, the abstract. He faces this notion that the next step in terms of what he's doing would be to make an abstract painting. And he literally backs away from it. This obviously comes from Berger the success and failure of Picasso, uh, that he literally start in a, in a funny way, especially with the sort of neoclassical works, starts all over again in the hopes of coming to some other conclusion. For Picasso, mimetic representation 
is something he can willfully distort to express events. He's not, it, or he can, as been pointed out num by a number of uh, the speakers, or he can use to create pastiches of differing styles, differing references, and so on. Seemingly, by the end, uh, at least in terms of the notebooks, which I uh, I don't have the dates in front of me, but in early 1960s, Picasso has worked his way to to literally being an ex expressionist, and it becomes a, a sort of interesting where, at least in terms of the notebooks and the exhibition built around the notebooks, he seems to have come full circle back to his sort of symbolist roots. So that's, given that I'm only a critic, that's the best I can do with Picasso. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and what are what are on um along the walls at pace? No, you're muted again, Saul. Uh what's on the walls around the room at pace are, are photo studio photographs, uh memorabilia. Uh, other other works that re are referenced in the sketchbooks. Uh, obviously, one of the in, one of the sort of interesting things about the sketchbook is, is that uh, while there the books themselves are open to only a single page, uh, digitally you can go go to, to see what what the pages previous and after that that open page. Uh, obvious what. And that's why I said it's a sort of mini retrospect and in terms of a mini retrospect of memorabilia and and minor work, basically minor works, other drawings, works on paper, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. And we have, un I think, until the 22nd to uh, go there. So Scarstead has, as, as the title, uh, suggests in dialogue with Picasso, there are three paintings by the master and then um, work like the uh, Francis Bacon to the left, um, where you feel the heads relate to something like Guernica or, or whatever. Um, I'm interested in the next slide. Um, my, and that's another of the Picassos in the show. Um, I was very interested in the illustration, the illustrational aspects of the influence. I was particularly taken by the Louise Lawler uh, photograph, which didn't look like a photograph. It, it, it was astonishingly um, like a pastel. But here is the Eric Fischel um, from his art, art fair series. And what intrigued me was the Liechtenstein sculptures looked more radical than the Picasso on the left of the Fischel, which you would think Picasso was this great revolutionary. But it, it, it was astonishing to see um, pop art with an expressionistic late Picasso. Um, I was uh, in love with the Richard um, Prince um, uh, collages in which he took pages of, from a book or a catalog. He took pages of a, of a Picasso book or catalog and, and, and added um, figurative elements and collage. And um, uh, there was an astonishing Jasper Johns that in the future might be confused with a Picasso and the brilliance of George Kondo in both this show and in Almine Resch. 
where George Kondo takes Picasso's vocabulary and makes a totally original work of art. So that's sort of my praise. And I think there's one more slide here. Yeah, that's a, a Baslitz on the back wall. And that's the third Picasso. Thanks, guys. And then I had the last show um, in our collection of Picasso shows. And like Saul, I am also not a Picasso scholar and in fact, have never even taken a Picasso class. So I was delighted to be one of the editors on many of the reviews because it was kind of like a crash course for me. So I, I thank all of the authors of the reviews. That was so helpful and lovely to read. Um, I reviewed two interrelated shows at Almin Resh. Um, one was down in Tribeca. This is a shot of the Tribeca show. And then one was um, in the original Upper East Side space. Uh, they had a few Picassos um, only up on the Upper East Side. And then they were paired with uh, painters who were either contemporaries of Picasso in that they were they um, were temporal contemporaries, and then also contemporary artists. So living younger artists working today. Um, and so what you're seeing is um, in this slide, all current working artists. And then in the next slide, a Picasso sculpture in the front, which was, um, as I mentioned in the review, my favorite piece in, in both of the shows. And then um, behind, one of the George Condos that Phyllis was just mentioning, and then also in Ernest Fisher kind of channeling the blue period of Picasso. Um, unfortunately, these shows are closed. They closed on the 16th, so you can't see them any longer. And so what I thought I would do is just leave us with a few questions um, so that we can think about them and not necessarily to answer them, but just to think about them as, as we close out this, this NSE. So, so much of what my fellow authors have talked about, I was writing down as they were speaking because they, they uh, reflect so much on these shows. So the question of um, pastiche of historical references, um, what does it mean when we start pastiching Picasso as the historical reference? Um, how does that work for us? And, and frankly, for him and for our understanding of his work. Similarly, the idea of Picasso saying, um, I'm a painter without style, I have no style. What happens to Picasso when he becomes a style for others? So not necessarily that he had a style, but rather that he is a style or perhaps could be a medium. Um, can Picasso then be a medium in contemporary art? And what do we do with that? How do we work with that? What do we make of that? How do we keep this artist that seems now so familiar strange? Um, if he's no longer a stranger, as Marianne was saying, um, how do we keep him odd? How do we keep him peculiar? How do we work with him in such a way that we then can be constantly startled by him and his work? Um, for me, that's what the sculpture that we're looking at here does. Uh, I particularly love these sculptures and I think they're so wonderful and odd. And then finally, um, how do we think about the radicality of Picasso? Um, how do we make radical work informed by Picasso? One of the things about these two shows that I that I reviewed that I really noticed is that the contemporary work was painting or sculpture, um, but what about video? What about performance? What about installation? Um, how do those media and the people who practice them, how do those reflect Picasso or not reflect Picasso? And then what does that mean too? Um, Pepe mentioned Sarah Z, which I think is, is a good reference to think about. And I was trying to think about other work too, um, we might think about Orlan, for example, as referencing a Duchamp, but could she in fact be referencing Picasso? Um, if you carve up your face, is that a Picasso in action rather than a Duchampian performance? And so just to end up, um, let's start thinking about Picasso and start thinking about all of the new questions that we can ask about him and his work.
Thanks so much. Wow, Amanda, that's why you're a terrific editor. So oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm glad I can acknowledge that in public. Um, those are fabulous questions. Um, does does anyone want want to respond to Amanda's question about pastiche and style? Yes. No. Please. Well, I'll take a go at it. Thank you. Um, although, I, I, Amanda, you you had so many excellent excellent questions. Could you just reread the one on pastiche, please? Uh, let me find it again. Sure. Um, you had actually mentioned that um, he's working on pastiches of historical references. I'm sorry, I don't have exactly the quote that you had you had read. Um, and, and of course we can see that. And it's something that I mentioned in my own review and all of us in fact have mentioned in our discussions and in our reviews. And what I was thinking about is that now Picasso himself is our historical reference. Um, if we think about Picasso's work challenging the Western tradition, what happens when he becomes one of the arbiters of the Western tradition? Um, what do we do with that? And how do we push it? Um, do we push against it? Do we push ourselves forward with it? How do we work with it? Well, that, that's a different question. I'm gonna go back to the question about sure, of course. Stage, but that's an excellent question too. Uh, I think uh, some of the contemporary artists are actually not doing pastiches. They're doing riffs on Picasso in certain moments of their style as opposed to a pasticcio, as opposed to a mix of this and that, and the choices of those this and that not being random, but specific in the way that the way that they're going to relate to each each other, and also high and low. So some of the some of the images you show the condo, for example, or a riff on a cubist Picasso, but I would not call them pasticcias in that sense of admixture and um, leveling and exalting and uh, historicizing and so it would be interesting to think of a contemporary artist who is doing genuine uh, pastiche we certainly had some examples in the postmodern period but I'm not sure in in the exact um, uh, images that we we saw and even the Eric Fischel is not a true pastiche because it's it's almost a mirror image of you will of a chance operation of things being in the same room even though it brings together brings together a different styles. I'm not sure if anyone else would like to agree or disagree. Um, can I just add to that? Not neither, not, I agree with what you just said, but let me add to it, which is when we think of relevance today, you know, the easiest heading under which to consider it is pastiche, is to look at artists who are doing that. But Amanda, as you suggested, I don't think George Kondo is doing a pastiche anymore. I mean, I, I, that's what I felt about some of his earlier work, but it seems to me the new paintings are genuine creations, you know, taking Picasso as a starting point and then doing something very personal and very original with that. And to me, part of the, the question of, um, you know, Picasso's continuing relevance or importance for us today has to do with the things that might not even look like him or not be intended to evoke him, but do anyway. On my last uh, tour through Chelsea, uh, I went to see an Alex Katz show of recent paintings. And there were some views where the model's head, there were two or three different views of the model's head from different points of view. And I suddenly thought, wow, it looks somewhat like Picasso's paintings of Dora Maar from the late 30s, where you see part of the face from one direction, part of it from another one. And in fact, cats changed the way I saw Picasso. I suddenly thought of the cats are in effect time-lapse pictures. And I suddenly thought of the Picassos that way, as though they were a succession of views that had somehow been combined into one. So, to me, it's not just about Picasso's relevance or availability as pastiche, but the way that if we look at contemporary art while thinking about history, contemporary art brings passages of history back to life, including passages of Picasso. 
Can I toss out another question about Ang? Um, Emily, I was so intrigued by the two, um, by your commenting about the woman in the armchair um, relating to um, Ang and Pepe, you've talked about this in the past. Why was Ang so important? Uh, my co-curator of Cubism in the Trompe l'Oeil tradition, Elizabeth Cowling, has written expertly on this subject. We know that Picasso went to look at the Ang retrospective, I think it was in 1912, which was nearby when he was vacationing, and uh, Ang represented as the Delacroix to antipodes, but the great, great figures of the mid-19th century French tradition. And I suppose as part of Annie Colin Salal's thesis about Picasso the foreigner, that he would want to match himself up with uh, great artists of the particular nation which he was, that chose to, to, to be an immigrant. So that would be Anne Grand Delacroix. But he was obviously attracted to the linear efficiency and precision of Anger, which was, of course, one of his own great strengths as a draftsman, right? Anger was a great, great draftsman. And then when Picasso goes on to, to do his first um, so-called neoclassical drawing of Ambroise Vallard and that of Max Jacob, he's doing a riff on uh, Ang's drawings with their very uh, empty backgrounds and the ability of line to conjure up so much, uh, both acknowledging the flatness of the plane and also the, the volume the volume of the figures. So he was a giant whom Picasso wanted to rival and he was, he was also an extraordinary draftsman, which is, one of the key things about Picasso, I think we can all agree, is his facility with line. Thank you. you. Know, let me add something to that, which is, uh, I think there's a specific quality to Ang, which is paradoxically his unrealism. You know, when he showed his Grand Odalisque of uh, 1814 in the Salon, people objected to it because you know, it had too many vertebrae. The anatomy was rearranged in ways, that, you know, no human being could actually look like that. And yet it made this, you know, profoundly satisfying, strange, but satisfying image. And to, to me, I mean, think about the, the picture we saw uh, a few minutes ago of the source, the reclining woman holding a vase in her lap that looks, you know, it's easy to say it's classical or it's neoclassical, but as the speaker pointed out, there's no human being that looks like that. You know, the proportions are all wrong. It, the, the, the limbs are bigger, smaller and everything. I mean, I would sum this up by saying that Picasso is a constructive artist. He's most of the time, he's not concerned with reproducing what the world looks like, even in his seemingly naturalistic images, he's constructing human bodies or constructing objects out of abstract bits and pieces, as he does in Cubism. And my guess is that that's part of what drew him to Ang. In addition to what Mimi was just saying, yes, Ang is a you know, towering figure of, of French 19th century art. But in addition to that, Ang is really strange. And, you know, there's that grand odalisque that's put together. If you think about his society portraits, the heads of the women, they're like they're eggs that have got hu human features attached to them. They're proto-abstract. I mean, they're proto-Picassos. And I, I think Picasso saw that in him and thought, yes, yes, that's that's where I come from or part of why I, where I come from. Ang, Ang, you know, especially late Ang becomes a man, almost a mannerist in which it's all about getting the figure to fit into the composition. Yes. Very much like Picasso. Absolutely. I think also it's interesting to look at Picasso's interest in El Greco. I mean, similar thing where he yeah. elongates the figure too, and Picasso takes that into consideration. But also with Ang and the French classical notion, I mean, for the show in Fontainebleau, um, I feel like Picasso was, he was looking at the figures in Fontainebleau. I mean, that's where the school of Fontainebleau is from and French classicism was born. So there's that influence too, but he takes it and completely makes it his own. Yeah, and those Fontainebleau paintings and sculptures, I mean, in addition to the uh, mural the, that they reproduced you know, in a photo in the exhibition, 
Um, the School of Fontainebleau, there's Jean Goujon, the sculptor, whose reliefs are now in the Louvre. They were originally on a fountain in Paris. They are truly weird and wonderful in ways <laughs> that look a lot like Picasso. <laughs> Too much. Eleanor, do you want to open this up to the audience? Sure, yeah. Thanks, Phyllis. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for this really wonderful dialogue and um, presentation. It's really brilliant. Um, we've got a question first from our friend GE today. If somebody else or if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question, please feel free to raise your hand or send a message in the chat. But GE, please go ahead and unmute. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you all for this, this, this wonderful treasure of writing and everything and, and thoughts. That question is, is the comparison of the picture with a living creature, Picasso's own realization that he was dealing with the ultimate form of complexity, the analog of, or, of organic life? Well, sometimes it's organic, sometimes it's inorganic. I mean, I, I'd say that, you know, with cubism, he sets himself the challenge of constructing organic creatures from inorganic components, you know, squares and triangles and whatnot. Uh, but then, you know, even weirder in the surrealist pictures, yes, it's like Frankenstein's monster. He takes organic bits of bodies and then rearranges them to make bodies like you've never seen before. Yeah. Thanks, GE. Um, we have another question from John. And John, I will give you the opportunity to unmute here if you'd like. Okay, thank you. This is a great discussion and the exhibitions are just marvelous and it's quite a treat in New York to have them all. Uh, my question is uh, perhaps the discussion of pastiche uh, brings us in, but what remains of avant-gardism as a valid art historical premise as we go forward? Anybody? So I think we're going to dump this one on you to start with. All right. Okay. The myth of the avant-garde. Should we start with the myth of the avant-garde and work our way back from there? <laughs> you know, uh, we can we can put the notion of the avant-garde into any number of uh, frameworks, including, and and for the most part, uh, at least my understanding of the avant-garde. Uh, uh, and its origins is basically uh, has to do with a shift in ideologies from uh, and the rise of the bourgeoisie who who needed their own culture and the avant-garde became became the advocates for that for bourgeois culture uh, the ongoingness of the avant-garde the ongoingness of the avant-garde up until and including the sort of po the postmodern would be the triumph of bourgeois culture and ultimately to a certain degree its decadence uh so the best that we can hope for is another revolution <laughs> <laughs> Well, with that, the sun has come out. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. <laughs> well, thank you for that question, John. Um, our final question for today will be coming from Fong. So Fong, please go ahead. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, Pepe, Mimi, So, Rebecca, Marianne, and Lastly, Amanda, um, I remember going to see the 
of course, uh, the legendary show, Pioneer and Cubism, that Mr. Rubin put it on with Kurt Manando <laughs> and other people. I think you were part, one of the participant writer, Pepe. And I. it was a very important show to understand the two incredible artists at the time and it just focusing on the only the beginning of cubism and i thinking back now because Cezanne's name mentioned it a little bit and then joachim did his show Cezanne and pisaro pioneer in modern painting and that was focusing on that collaboration i think 1865 to 1885 or something that period which to me seems to be so useful to thinking about that powerful influence that Cezanne had on Picasso. And you mentioned about the ability that the tactility that you mentioned early on, Phyllis, that led to his finally making sculpture. It's interesting to think of how Cezanne had that same commitment to tactility because I'm thinking now of the early Cezanne's show that Sir Lauren Gowan did in the late 80s when I was still in art school. I remember making a trip to see it. And actually not long ago, <laughs> a month ago, I was talking to Jasper, Jasper John, about this subject, about that same show and the whole idea of how to restrain that he learned so much from Pissarro. So the notion of restrain the emotional, um, I would say emotional life, all that disturbing anxiety that he had lived with him. Remember early theme of Cezanne up to that point, the way that he associated with Dalakwa was unachievable, unattainable. That Dalakwa number one is a cosmopolitan, handsome Parisian. Uh, the number one dandy of all time. <laughs> and he had such eloquent of skill that Cezanne lacked. So the, the idea of thinking in the imagination without the concreteness, everyday practice, going to see and paint what he really uh, set up before him, the steel eye, uh, would be super useful for his growth. So my question it's very simple because I'm making it a little longer than I should make it clearer, <laughs> but I can't help it. But years ago, I remember reading Patrick O'Brien's biography on Picasso. Yeah. He described very clearly when Picasso brought Rock to the train to join the front in the first war. And he knew that would be the end of analytical cubism. He went on. And that collaboration will be ended. Why it's so fascinating, and we're still talking about Picasso, for me, I can't help but think about what he said to Christian Yervos. And you can correct me, I don't remember the exact date, Pepe, Mimi, really. But I remember he said to the effect that what forces our interest is Cezanne anxiety. It's so interesting to me that as a young painter, who recognize the monumental anxiety is something to explore, to be explored, not to be kept, like the way that Cezanne had finally surrendered to the wisdom of Pissarro, who insisted on him that you must work from nature. <laughs> Otherwise, the potential growth as a painter would never happen. Because I talked to uh, Jasper about this, because had Cezanne die at 1872, would he be remembered as a great painter? And I decisively say no. You know, um, so what is my question? It's a matter of how to uh, adopt, assimilate, cultivate a perpetuous anxiety and the, slide, the stylelessness into a unity of style. And to me, it's a matter of speed. You know, as a Fontainebleau that Rebecca had revealed, there's a minute, tiny little miniature painting of the ne uh, of neoclassical style of a nude, beautifully rendered. Would take him easily a month to make that painting, or at least a couple of weeks in any case, 
whereas other could be so fast, quickly executed in a matter of an hour or not. So I don't know how to describe it, whether it's a question or not, but I don't think we ever experienced any painter throughout history who able to materialize and mobilize the different kind of speed according to what is as the painter, the picture beforehand to be painted accordingly. In other words, his thinking is so fast and the hand were able to deploy train to accommodate that different speed. So I, I guess my question is about speed ultimately and how he's managed to do it simultaneously. As, as Rebecca has mentioned also, in the morning he can paint a synthetic cubist painting in the afternoon, the same day, neoclassical painting. So that's my question. <laughs> Mimi, Pepe, and Amanda, and Mary, and Saul, and Rebecca, and Phyllis too. What do you think about that notion? I think it's interesting that Picasso, he takes in so many things from every reference. I mean, first from his father, who was his first teacher, he painted pigeons, to then with George Brock and cubism. And I think the speed question is interesting because he just, ever if you read like the biography, it's like first he did this, then he did that. He did it in sculpture. He did it in painting. I mean, if you see the Hispanic Society show, he did it in sugar lift tint aqua prints, like which is a, something I've never heard of before. It was so interesting how fast, how like amazingly he worked on it. I think he just was able to like understand a style and execute it really easily. I don't know how he did it. It's I think what makes him so great. But I think just the way that he looked at everything and did his own version of it. I don't know. If I think about sense. speed and speed and surrealism. Remember all that thing with Superboard and Breton and the speed at which you think are right. So it seems to me to bring up everything. I mean, the word speed brings up a bunch of stuff, especially surrealist stuff. I'd like to decouple the concept of speed from anxiety, Fong. I mean, I, I, I think you brought them together in an interesting way, but I mean, Picasso just had an unbelievable facility. When I was helping Bill Rubin with pioneering cubism, <clears throat> we counted up how many canvases each of them finished in the years 1907 through 1914. And for Brock, it was 200, which seems like a reasonable number. For Picasso, it was 700. Mm -hmm. So he was working really fast on these pictures that are incredibly dense and complicated. But coming back to the anxiety, let me toss out a theory. This may be total nonsense. I mean, this is just a response to what you said, just, you know, fresh off the riddle. Um, it seems to me that Cezanne's anxiety, you know, starts out as being emotional, sexual, all those things you can feel in the early work. And thanks to Pissarro's brilliant intervention, it instead becomes the anxiety about sensation and perception and the endless quest to capture, you know, what Cezanne called his petite sensation. He would just go back day after day after day trying to get it right. With Picasso, it's something else because he's not really interested in capturing perception and sensation. But I think the anxiety becomes almost ontological. Like, what does it mean to make a picture? What does it mean to draw a human figure? What does it mean to create a space in which figures and objects could exist? And obviously he ends up repeating himself. It's not really true that he's a painter without a style. He's got, you know, a finite number of styles, but one does feel, you know, this sense of that every morning he gets up trying to start all over again, trying to forget everything he knows and asking, what the hell does it mean to make a painting? What the hell does it mean to make a sculpture? And that's a kind of anxiety, a self-imposed anxiety, which is, it seems to me, really admirable. I, right. Pepe, I, I do think Picasso was interested in perception and sensation, uh, particularly in the years 1909 through, through 1912. Uh, you can see him working with, sh with shadows in particular in a way that uh, shows that he's, he's very consciously thinking about 
the way the eye and the mind works and the perception of shadows. If I may just go back to the issue of speed uh, and simply say that speed did not always um, end up well for Picasso. Picasso painted a lot of very bad paintings. Mm -hmm. And so um, the facility that that exhibits that speed or vice versa, the speed that exhibits the facility also leads to a lot of bad paintings. <laughs> okay, Mimi. Uh, all right. So can we shift quickly from speed, which is you are an expert on Italian futurist uh, artists, uh, including one of our favorite, not quite part of futurist movement, um, Sironi, but can we shift to the subject from speed to uh, the inventiveness of it all? In other words, when we remember how Matisse came to play catch up with Cubism, which is what Elderfield did that brilliant show, Radical Invention. Uh, same thing with Mondrian. I mean, these are both artists who are much older than Picasso. Mondrian began experiment uh, with Cubism as soon as he arrived to Paris, 1911. This is going back to your reference to Paula Pepe, uh, because it's so interesting that I remember vaguely reading in Art Magazine, a brilliant article that Barbara Rose wrote about the, without the Mondrian picture that eliminate the convention of frame or framing uh, by extending that rectilinear, you know, vertical and horizontal relationship that go beyond the painting, Pollock would not be possible. So I'm thinking about that invention, how from a, the kind of logical conclusion that Mondrian able to brought to pubis idiom and then extend it to various possibility that allow Pollock to undertake his, his own idea of how to eliminate the frame and then put on the floor, a radical act for sure. But I don't remember how uh, careful I read of it, but I'm sure I, I'm asking in terms of why cubism is still matter today. Yes, Phyllis? Oh, okay, I think we just have to refer to the six absinthe glasses that he radically invented each one of them that are so different. I mean, most of us know the one that is about to go to the mat uh, the Leonard Lauder, and the one in the, the modern. So I was absolutely astonished the other day to see that the one that Almine Resch and her husband, Bernard Picasso own, um, the one that seems not to be treated, but you just look at the inventiveness of how he painted these six variations and you have, you, you have, part of his secret. Okay. Well, I'm, I rest my case. I think I heard enough. Thank you so much. <laughs> I urge everybody to come and see the other show, the, those that are still on view. And so thank you so much, Pepe. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Mimi and So. And uh, back to you, Eleanor. Thank you so much, Fong. Um, and yeah, thank you so, so much again, um, everyone for the conversation and insights today. Um, we have a tradition here at The Rail of concluding our events with a poetry reading. And today I am so thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Ron Horning to the stage. Born in Ohio and raised in South America, Ron Horning currently lives in Beacon, New York. His poems, translations, and criticism have appeared in The New Yorker, Aperture, The Brooklyn Rail, and other publications. Ron, thank you so much for being here. All right. Can you all hear me? The first poem is called Studio Visit. He scans the drawing and smiles. I look like a cardinal, completely familiar with the atom-splitting propensities of compression about which, in fact, 
as I have been trying to tell you. I know next to nothing. I didn't learn from someone else I probably don't remember. So the portrait is accurate. Could be, I say, lighting another imaginary cigarette in Paris. While drawing, I wasn't so much looking at your face as I was strolling through the Luxembourg gardens at dusk, trawling the divine trove of images in the Louvre, watching a good tartuffe at the Comédie, a better race at Longchamp. That is, I was in Rome, vainly listening in the lobbies of hotels and in the private homes to which I had been invited to a late breakfast, an early tea, for the voice of a child, a swift toccata of small shod feet running along parquet floors, a delighted yell, all grace and innocence. Maybe I got off lucky then, he says, as he examines the gouache again. He has to say yes before I go ahead with an oil. There are worse things to seem on a city street than sterile. And if I'm not smiling, at least the corners of my mouth aren't drawn downward to death, primitive, brutal, anti-aesthetic, ugly. But as for those children, I don't know. Alexandrian Greeks didn't understand how a sculptor could let the rhythm method, is it, govern his sex life, and at the same time be able to portray a woman convincingly in marble, in the round, I guess you could say. Children mean nothing in art, but if I had to choose between Venus de Milo and a Bolivian hat woman offering her breast to her child with both hands, I'd bow down to both. I do so in this drawing of you, though none can see it. Both women are there at the same time. Neither one replaces the other. He says, not on Rue Remusat, where the desire of a mind to dominate has been known to leave more than one head completely bald, and where even mannequins dream a function of blood, mine, as if commenting on an objective reality, or perhaps it's the other reality that illuminates the dream. Either way, harmony. He seems to be leaving, though no bargain has been made. Been thinking of Peru? Of course, a cardinal never stops. What is he saying? A cardinal never stops. The oil, he wants it. And its future? Like the churches, it will come from within. He actually is a cardinal. How can I be sure what he wants? I see him to the door. By now, the code of our conversation has taken over to such an extent the phrases ricocheting off each other nonstop, that the only thing I am sure of as we say goodbye is the whiteness of snow that falls slowly on Paris, reflected in his spectacles, the window behind me. And the other poem is called Reminder. <clears throat> in the cabin's kitchen foyer, the cat clock's black and white eyes go left, right, left, and its black pendulum tail. Hastily finishing a donut, she likes the commercial and elevators across the lobby, idle, of course, hushed too, shag carpet in living room, window on the Potomac, and why do they try to cross an expressway on foot after dark or both? Turkish general, Chinese spies, an office where X obstructs breath, a smooth operator content to smile thanks to a new band, which unfortunately thinks she means scram. Minutes later, they peel out of the lot, head for the nearest bar, the bucket shop if Louis's alive, Annabelle's if he isn't, long grass swaying in a cross-cut breeze. She's afraid of all the summer colonies that come back to him now that he's awake and making another vague excuse for the rent while he tries to recall if he'd ever seen a picture of the trio again, too gaudy for daytime, too simple for dressy, wave the long chain of marinas where a few boats are still tied. The cav? Did she go to or teach at St. Anne's on the hill? Maybe the hunt club that Sunday 
He and Jerry hitchhike out for the first fall horse show. No idea why they're going. And now he has to make his way back to Charlottesville solo. Jerry long gone. Sonia and Steve. Larry and Andrea too. And he can't be entirely sure that he's here himself with borrowed glasses, the ones with black plastic frames and a library of kids scared by news with the rough parts detached underwater and creating a badly damaged offer. One minute missing the next, able to talk back as he scans recording drum first, then the delicate wavy lines, a brain pattern that makes more sense if he reaches for a Winston, strikes a match, finally inhales the good, clean, white smoke, appearance misleading, facts buried in a conference room accident, exploited by someone who doesn't know the setup, still waits, a slip of paper that leaves him dizzy, wondering at messages too late for what? She didn't say, he didn't ask. That's it. Thank you. Wonderful, Ron. Thank you so, so much for the reading. Um, and thank you so very much again to Pepe, Emily, Rebecca, Marianne, Saul, Amanda, and Phyllis for the wonderful conversation today and for your contributions and your reviews. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring the NSC and for supporting our archive, which is on our YouTube channel and where this conversation will be posted shortly. We are also fundraising $200,000 this season to directly support our writers, guest artists, and production staff and all of our operations at the rail. As a small nonprofit, we need your support, so please consider donating to support our work. There's a link in the chat to that. Um, join us when, at 1 p.m. tomorrow for a conversation with Brandon Fernandez and Elizabeth Buey on the occasion of Within Reach at Susan Ingle Gallery. And we will conclude with a reading tomorrow by Anselm Berrigan. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. And thanks for the wonderful conversation. And you can now all turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks Thank to everyone. everyone. Thank, Thank you, so everyone. Much. Happy holidays to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.